Morning, everyone. We'll just give everyone a couple seconds to get logged in here before we get started. Okay, um, we'll all get us started and people can continue to join. So good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Invasive Species Center's webinar series. My name is Rebecca Durazio, and I am the Aquatic Invasive Species Specialist at the Invasive Species Center, and I will be your moderator for today's webinar, which is part of our Asian Carp Canada webinar series. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that the Invasive Species Center honors the long history of the First Nations, Inuit, and Métis Nation peoples on the lands now known as Canada, and strives to show respect to their ancestors, their communities, and to them individually. The Invasive Species Center respectfully acknowledges that our head office is located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, the Batchewana, and Garden River First Nations, as well as the longtime settlement of the Métis people in the Robinson Huron Treaty area. The Invasive Species Center is a not for profit organization that connects stakeholders, knowledge, and technology to prevent the introduction and spread of invasive species that harm Canada's environment, economy, and society. We have a lot of great invasive species resources on our website. Uh, this includes species profiles, some best management practices, and tons more. So visit our website at invasivespeciescenter.ca and you can sign up on our homepage for our newsletter, bi weekly media scan, learn about event invitations, um, and hear all about upcoming webinars as well. And we also have a website dedicated to information on Asian carps. So you can check out species profiles, uh, information on early detection surveillance, prevention, read up on risk assessments, and a lot more on our website, asiancarp.ca. We're also hosting a grass carp information session later this month, uh, taking place on March 27th. It'll be at 6.30 p.m. And it's going to feature presentations from experts on both sides of the border. So we'll have reps from DFO, the Ohio DNR, University of Tol uh, Toronto Scarborough and USGS. And the, the focus of the session will be the status of grass carp in Canada and the US and the work being done to protect the Great Lakes. So you can visit our website again, asiancarp.ca, scroll down a little bit to upcoming events and sign up. So before we get started with today's webinar, um, there's a couple of things I wanna go over. We will have time for questions at the end of the webinar. So if you have them at any time, please type them in the question box and I will read it at the end of the webinar to our presenter. If you're having any technical difficulties, you can type them in the chat box or respond to the email that would be found in your registration and we can try and resolve it for you. We've also enabled closed captioning. So if you'd like to follow along that way, you can turn that on with the closed caption button on your taskbar. And lastly, there will be a brief survey following the webinar. So if you could take some time to fill that out, we would really appreciate it. Today's webinar is titled Grass Carp Egg Sampling and Known Spawning Tributaries of Lake Erie and Beyond. And I am pleased to introduce our speaker, Ryan Brown. Ryan earned his Bachelor of Science and Master of Science from the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. After graduation, he started working in the private sector as a GIS specialist. In 2021, he joined the University of University of Toledo Grass Carp Project, where he ran a crew removing adult grass carp from Lake Erie tributaries. Then in 2022, he was promoted to the field research crew leader, where he currently runs the Grass Carp Early Life History team. He also manages the database for the entire Grass Carp Project. So thank you so much to Ryan for joining us today. And I'll stop sharing my screen now and, and pass things over to you. Sounds good. I will share my screen. All right, is that visible? Yep, perfect. Awesome, so thank you for the introduction, Rebecca, and thanks for inviting me to be a part of this webinar series. Uh, I'm glad to be a part of it. So as previously mentioned, I'll be talking about grass carp egg sampling and known spotting tributaries of Lake Erie and beyond today. So just a little bit of background on invasive carp in general. Uh, we're trying to using the term invasive carp now instead of Asian carp, it's a little bit more accurate, um, but there's four species of invasive carp that are kind of lumped into this category. There's big heads, silver, black, and grass carps. Most people, however, when they hear the term invasive carp, they're really thinking about silver carp. Um, so these are the top right here, and these fish are the jumpers. So you know, you see them on the river, if you're just boating down the Illinois River, wherever, um, they're jumping by the hundreds, jumping by the thousands. However, these other invasive carp species are not exhibiting that type of behavior. Um, so today, you know, just gonna be talking about grass carp specifically, which again, you know, are not jumpers. Uh, they're just swimming along in the river. 
So getting into a little bit about them, they spawn similarly to those other invasive carp species I just mentioned. Um, they have similar spawning hues, which I'll talk about a little bit later, um, and similar spawning conditions. So if there is another invasion with one of these other species, we might be better prepared for it. We kind of know where to look and you know how to control or suppress them. Um, hopefully that doesn't happen. Hopefully, you know, it's just grass carp and we can do what we can to control them. All right, it's a little bit about grass carp uh, invasion timeline. So they're imported to the United States in 1963 to control aquatic vegetation. As their name indicates, they're herbivores feeding primarily on aquatic vegetation. So they're really good at it, eat a lot of it. Um, you know, and since 1963, they were stocked, um, you know, throughout the United States. 1983, the first triploid grass carp was developed, and the term triploid really refers to um, it's sterile, so it's not able to naturally reproduce. You know, the thought being that they could stock these triploid grass carp in areas where aquatic vegetation needs to be controlled, and there'd be little to no risk of establishing a population, um, you know, of grass carp. And Ohio DNR did a study on that a little while ago, and you know, it is really low risk with this triploid process of actually you know, a diploid or fish able to naturally reproduce slipping through the cracks. Um, since the mid-1980s, there's been reports of grass carp captured in the Lake Erie Basin by commercial fishermen. Um, these captures are pretty infrequent and they were assumed to be sterile, um, sort of triploid, until 2012, when four juvenile grass carp were found in the Sandusky River by commercial fishermen. Um, you know, otolith mechochemistry, so otoliths are the, the fish bones or the fish ear bones. Um, so some chemical, chemical analysis on that revealed that those fish originated from the Sandusky River um, and then ploidy analysis determined they were diploid as well. So they are able to naturally reproduce and they came from the Sandusky River, which is obviously not a good thing. So why are they a threat? So with, you know, natural recruitment going on in you know, 2012 in the Sandusky River, that's not good. So they're able to naturally reproduce. They can eat to 100% of their body weight per day in aquatic vegetation. Um, something, one thing I did not mention, these fish get pretty large, you know, up to four or five feet in length. They can get up to 80 pounds. It's generally, you know, 30, 40 pounds is about where they get in this area of the Great Lakes. So they're a huge fish and they can eat a lot of vegetation. So that can really cause a lot of harm, um, especially when they're abundant in these aquatic ecosystems. So if we use the state of Ohio as an example, they're doing a lot of wetland restoration efforts right now through programs such as H2 Ohio. Um, specifically doing wetland restorations around Lake Erie. Um, so, you know, if we have grass carp roaming around in Lake Erie, um, eating all that vegetation, it's not good. It's kind of counter, counterproductive to what they're trying to accomplish. And also grass carp captures have increased in recent years as well. So kind of moving along the timeline. So since, you know, those juvenile fish were found in 2012 in the Sandusky River, that set off a really large chain reaction of research and management effort. Um, so really wanted, we wanted to find out when they're spawning in the Sandusky River, just confirm spawning in the Sandusky River, uh, which happened in 2015. A Uni University of Toledo graduate student, Holly Emke, found the first fertilized eggs in the Sandusky River. Um, in 2017, we found the first fertilized eggs in the Maumee River. Um, and a year later, uh, the first strike teams were deployed, and those strike teams are adult removal crews going out there specifically targeting adult grass carp and removing them from the system via electrofishing, or using trammel nets or gill nets. In 2018 was also the first year we found our first grass carp larvae, which were in the Maumee River as well. Um, and actually to date, those are the only larvae we have found. So six larvae from the same day in 2018 in the Maumee River. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, and so there's continued effort today to both sample eggs and larvae on the Sandusky and Maumee Rivers, which are the only two known spawning tributaries of Lake Erie. And also, um, effort to remove adults in those rivers as well, along with other tributaries of Lake Erie and the Great Lakes in general. All right, so those of you not familiar with where the Maumee and Sandusky are located, they're in the western basin of Lake Erie. Um, the Maumee is on the left here and it flows through Toledo, Ohio, uh, so just south of the Michigan-Ohio border. The Sandusky River is on the right and it flows through uh, Fremont, Ohio, into Sandusky Bay of Lake Erie. So just you can kind of get a general idea of where these rivers are located in the Great Lakes. Um, but what about grass carp elsewhere? So adults have been captured in every Great Lake except Lake Superior. Um, you know, the infrequent captures, but they are being captured. Um, there's established populations along the Mississippi River Basin um, and sporadic captures elsewhere across the United States as well. So as you can see from this maroon colored map, that's where all the grass carp captures have been 
uh, found. So, but where are, what about our Lake Erie area and our Great Lakes area here? Um, they're relatively rare right now. So, which is, which means it's time to act. You know, the longer we wait, um, the more the management costs are gonna be, the greater the ecological impacts are gonna be. You know, I do wanna stress, we don't know where we're at on this invasion curve. So we have to do what we can now to kind of control that population and control spread, you know, as much as we can. All right, and to do that, a good way to kind of figure out spread and kind of control spread is looking for grass carp eggs and provide a really good early warning system or a warning system. Um, and really the only consistent measure of early life history in the Lake Erie Basin. Um, so we capture eggs, you know, as I mentioned before, we captured a few larvae, but they're only from the same day in 2018. We have not caught any larvae since then. Um, so really, you know, we're catching eggs or we have to wait until they recruit to our strike team gears at about four to five years of age. Um, I can probably count in one hand how many juvenile grass carp we've caught since the project began. So it's really eggs or adults is what we're finding. And so it's a lot easier to capture eggs than it is adults as well. You know, I'll get into the methods a little bit later, but we, you know, set our nets in the river, uh, the eggs just float in. We're catching sometimes, you know, just tens, sometimes hundreds, and sometimes thousands. So it really depends, but it's a lot easier than capturing these adults, which takes a lot of effort, you know, with electrofishing and net setting. Um, and adult captures, we're really, we're capturing less than 200 per year since the project began. So it's easier to find these eggs or capture these eggs. And also, as I mentioned, it's an indicator of potential spawning locations, or in this case, potential uh, recruitment locations as well. So if we end up finding grass carp eggs in another river that they have not previously been found in, that's a big red flag. Obviously, we have to do a lot of work to figure out what's going on there and figure out what we can do to control that. And so a little bit about their spawning behaviors. Uh, they gather in rivers during high flows to spawn. Um, and that is really because their, negs are, or their eggs are negatively buoyant. Um, so it means they will sink if they don't have flow um, and their chances of survival increase, you know, as they move down the river. So they could survive if they settle, but in, chances of survival increase as they keep moving down. So that really requires high flow events for them to spawn, which coincides with the 85 to 90 percentile of historical flows, or as we like to refer to it as peaks and discharge. So it keeps those eggs suspended and keeps them moving down the river where they can eventually or maybe hatch. So if you look at the graph on the right, so this is a hydrograph of the Sandusky River from 2017. Um, on the y-axis here, we have discharge. On the x-axis, we have date. Um, so that black solid line is uh, our discharge, and the black dotted line is our 85th percentile of historical flow. And these blue sampling dots, or these blue dots, are sampling events where we've caught grass carp eggs. So as you can see, they're all on these peaks in the hydrograph. Um, and these red dots are sampling events where we did not capture grass carp eggs. So quite a few of them are below the dotted line, but there are some above it, you know, which can mean a few different things. And I'll get into that a little bit later. So there could be spawning happening. We did not detect it. There could be no spawning. We're not sure, but we didn't capture any eggs on that date. So it's generally thought that water temperatures between 18 and 28 degrees Celsius or kind of prefer water temperatures for them to spawn. Um, from our data in the Sandusky and Maumee here in Lake Erie, we found grass carp eggs between 17 and 24 degrees Celsius, uh, which uh, prefer temperatures between 20 and 22. So that seems like. All right, so getting into the goal of the early life history side of the grass carp project and really this talk, we wanna figure out when and where grass carp are spawning in the Great Lakes. And for this talk, we have three objectives we're gonna kind of talk about to get at this. We'll go through them one by one, starting with the first objective, which is monitoring known spawning tributaries uh, and this is really figuring out when they spawn in these tributaries. So again, just a reminder, the Maumee and Sandusky are the only known spawning tributaries of Lake Erie and the Great Lakes so far. Um, so these are the rivers we're focusing on right now. Um, so we use paired ichthyoplankton or bongo nets as they're called uh, with 500 micron mesh. So it's pretty fine mesh, but not too fine. These grass carp eggs are pretty big. Um, and we have two different setups for this. So on the left, we have a, it's called a bow mounted kind of fixed net position mechanism um, where we have a surface net that's at a set or a fixed um, depth and then a deep net, which is at a fixed depth as well, about a meter and a half down in the water. Um, we have upgraded that boat since this picture has been taken, but that mechanism is still the same. And on the right, we have what is it called a remote controlled boom system. So we use remote controls to raise and lower these nets in the water. 
Um, we still have our surface net that's just below the surface, but we're able to adjust the depth of our deep net here, which is pretty pretty cool, and it really helps us, you know, kind of get at a better um, better part of the water column. And so we can raise and lower it based on you know water conditions and the site location. All right, so a little bit more about the methods. So we do bilateral toes. So on the left and right side of the river and those bilateral toes are five minutes in length. Um, sometimes channel morphology is limiting. So the rivers can be pretty narrow, um, some of them at least. And in, in spots we can't do a left and the right side, we just do a single center channel toe, uh, which is 10 minutes in length. And so as I mentioned before, we use service and deep paired bongo nets with our deep net. We try to get about halfway down the water column. And so when we bring those nets up, we wash them down. And at the bottom of these nets, there's these, they're called cod ends. So we wash all the sample contents down in the cod end, pour the cod end into our sample jars, along with some ethanol, and store them and bring them back to the lab for processing. And so that lab processing uh, consists of picking grass carp eggs out of these samples, if there are present, and then picking all the, the or picking all the larval fish out of there as well, so we can eventually ID those a little bit later on. Um, so getting into the grass carp eggs, um, they're pretty distinct from most other fish eggs. Uh, they're very large and they have a, a clear membrane um, associated with them as well. So in this picture on the right, um, the egg on the far right is a grass carp egg. Uh, it's over three millimeters in diameter. Um, that's generally a good indicator of a grass carp egg. They're three to five millimeters in diameter. Um, and these Eggs in the left, the two eggs in the left are a lot smaller. So they're under two millimeters in length. So there's really a big difference between grass carp eggs and a lot of other fish eggs, except a couple other, so a couple other fish species. So emerald shiners have pretty similar kind of egg structure to grass carp eggs. However, they're just a little bit smaller than three millimeters. So they can be confused sometimes. Um, but the most similar one is our silver chub eggs, which are pretty identical to grass carp eggs. So um, genetic, I Genetic identification is really kind of needed to differentiate those, those eggs. But silver chub are not found in a lot of these rivers. So um, we can really kind of confirm that they are grass carp if they came from like the Sandusky River, let's say. Whereas in the Maumee, uh, silver chub are there. So we need to kind of use genetic confirmation to, to know for sure. So once we pick out all the grass carp eggs, our next step is to stage the eggs. Um, and we do that based off of cell division, which is pretty cool to see. So in this top right picture here uh, is a grass carp egg pretty early on in the development process. It's probably a stage anywhere between one and three. So as you can see, there's four distinct cells on that embryo. Um, a little, the next stage down, you know, stage four or so is that eight cell stage, which is the bottom right picture. So, you know, cell division is visible in these embryos, which is pretty cool to see. And it's really helping us figure out where they're at in the development process. Um, in the bottom left picture is about halfway through. Um, I think there's 29 or so egg stages in total before it hatches into a larvae. And so this egg stage information is actually really critical to know. Um, USGS researchers have developed a hydrodynamic model called FluEgg, where it takes in this egg stage information along with environmental variables um, and flow conditions to predict hatch locations of these eggs. And they can also kind of run that in reverse and predict spawn locations of these eggs. So we can figure out where these fish are spawning and where these eggs might hatch, you know, which is really critical information when trying to control a population such as grass carp. All right, so if we look at historical egg captures in the Sandusky River, um, on the y-axis here, we have eggs per sample. On the x-axis, we have year, and just below the year is the number of samples for that year. Um, so as you can see here, egg captures are pretty variable across years. Um, 2015 was the first year we were sampling and was the first year we caught fertilized eggs. But we only caught eight of them, so it wasn't too many. And we didn't catch any in 2016. However, in both those years, in 15 and 16, we were using only a surface bongo net, where in 2017 and beyond, we added a second paired bongo net in, you know, in the deep part of the river um, for those years, which really helped increase egg captures, which is pretty interesting. So, 17 and 18 were the big capture years for us. Um, 2019 had a lot of eggs, you know, total. Um, but again, eggs per sample is pretty similar to our egg captures for 2022. Um, but another thing to note here is there's kind of a steady decrease since 2018 the amount of effort put on the Sandusky as we kind of shift our sampling efforts to other Lake Erie tributaries and other tributaries around the Great Lakes. Um, 
Also, one thing to note here in 2020, sampling is pretty limited uh, due to COVID-19. So looking at the MOMI now, we have the same y-axis but different scale, 10 times fewer, uh, and same x-axis here. I think I mentioned earlier that sampling on the MOMI didn't begin until 2017. So that's why there's zeros in 15 and 16 for effort. Um, but again, egg captures are quite variable in the MOMI too. So 18 was a big capture year. There were some caught in 2017 and 2019. Uh, but again, not a lot, you know, eggs per sample wise. And there was no sampling in 2020. However, in 2021 and 2022, we did increase the amount of effort on the mommy quite a bit, but we have not caught eggs since 2019. And I'll kind of maybe get at why that might be a little bit later on in the presentation. All right, so when do these captures occur? Um, so we regularly sample kind of April through August uh, for early life history for grass carp but we've only caught eggs uh, May through July. So as you can see here, uh, May has the most years where eggs have been captured. Um, there's kind of a lot of boom, kind of boom years for June and July. You know, a lot of those eggs in June came from 2018, while a lot of those eggs in July came from 2019. Um, but really the thing to take note here is that May through July is when these fish are spawning, uh, you know, during those preferred water temperature and flow conditions. So what else is kind of, you know, cueing them to spawn, you know, or what other preferences do they have? Does hydrograph location matter? So, you know, if the hydrograph is rising, do they want to spawn then? Or does it not matter if it's you know, descending, do they want to spawn then? We're not sure. So that's what we, something we looked at here uh, from two sites on the Sandusky River between 2015 and 2022 with our historical data. Um, we really found kind of no difference in spawning between ascending and descending with the number of samples of grass carp eggs present. It's not saying they don't prefer one over the other, but we just haven't identified it yet or haven't found any you know, clear patterns with this yet. So something to keep in mind and maybe look at in the future, but nothing that's obvious right now. So looking at another hydrograph from the Sandusky River, this one's from 2021 and 2022. Um, you know, the y-axis here is discharge. Again, the x-axis is date. These red sampling dots are sampling events where we did not capture grass carp eggs, while the black dots are sampling events where we did. The kind of gray shaded region in the middle is, you know, kind of a time frame where sampling is not conducive or sampling where we just don't sample. You know, it's winter for most of that, and water temperatures are too low in other parts where we could sample. So it's really not I don't know, worth it a while right now to sample during that time frame. But as you can see here, um, all those black dots are above that 85th percentile of historical flow line, which makes sense. They need those high flows to kind of spawn. Um, there's quite a few red dots below that line, but there's also quite a few above that line as well. And, you know, I kind of alluded to it earlier, in those peaks, there may be spawning, we don't detect it, or those water temperatures might be too cold still for the spawning to occur. So there's really a lot of variables that could be contributing to those kind of non-detections in the red dots above the historical flow line. All right, so wrapping up our first objective, we know they spawn May through July during peaks in the hydrograph. The kind of knowledge gap right now is influence of time of day. You know, they prefer to spawn in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening. Um, it's kind of hard to get at, but something on our radar. And then also other non-hydrological features. I think there's some theories floating around that barometric pressure might be one of the cues for grass carp to start moving into the river and moving up in the upper section of, let's say, the Sandusky River to wait for those high flows to hit and spawn. All right, so getting into our second objective, which is to sample other high risk tributaries. So, this is the where part of the goal. So, figuring out where grass carp might be spawning elsewhere in the Great Lakes. And so, we have five other rivers that we sample besides the Sandusky and Maumee. Um, they're all listed here. Three of them are in Ohio, the Cuyahoga, Huron, and Grand Rivers, and two of them are in Michigan. One is a Lake Michigan tributary, which is the St. Joseph River. One is a Lake Huron tributary, which is a Titabawassee River. But the really big thing to note here is this far right column where it's zeros across the board, you know, which is good. We want to see zeros, but those zeros come with a lot of questions. You know, we don't, they still could be spawning, spawning in these rivers and we just haven't detected it. Um, so we have imperfect detection that leads to a lot of uncertainty, um, but we can reduce that by continued monitoring of these rivers, which, which we plan to do. All right, so just 
to give you a sense of where all these other rivers are located, they cover a really large geographic area. Um, you know, we're going almost all the way over to Pennsylvania with the Grand River in Ohio. You know, and the St. Joseph River is a three and a half hour drive from where we're based out of. The Tittabawassee is a three hour drive. So we have a large area to cover and we're trying to hit these high flow events. It's really hard to hit those, you know, those rivers at the right times. Um, especially the Cuyahoga River, which if you're familiar with the Cuyahoga, it's very flashy. It's a very channelized river. So the flows go up fast, but they also drop really fast. And so our other issue there is we have a two hour drive to the, the Cuyahoga. But we also have another two hour drive on the river from the mouth of the river up to our sample sites, you know, through downtown Cleveland, through the industrial zone, and all the way above the industrial zone to our sample sites. So it's really a cumulative like four and a half hour drive to get to our sites in the Cuyahoga, you know, which makes it hard to sample these peaks. Um, so this is the hydrograph of the Cuyahoga River in 2021 and 2022. Um, kind of the set up the same way as the Sandusky one was previously, our y-axis is discharge, or x-axis is date, and these red dots are sampling events where grass carp eggs were not captured. So again, um, it's all red dots, which is what we like to see, but a lot of these red dots are below that historical flow line. We did, we did uh, manage to get above that line in um, July of 2021, um, so a lot of those samples, you know, these, the Cuyahoga, you know, it rises fast, drops fast, you know, may only, be, may only be above that historical flow line for about an hour or two, or maybe a couple hours, and drop right away. So it's really hard to hit these peaks. You know, we, may, we managed to get on some of those peaks in 2022, but again, those peaks are pretty small compared to previous years, uh, especially 2021. So it's really, it's really difficult to sample these. But we have a pretty cool tool that USG has developed to kind of help us with timing these high flow conditions in these rivers. And so this is US, or this is Spawncast, which is developed by USGS researchers. It helps forecast river discharge, which is that bottom graph. It also helps forecast uh, river water temperatures, which is the top graph. So it's really cool. Uh, we can know a few days in advance, um, you know, whether this, what time or essentially what day roughly the river is going to peak based on weather conditions and all sorts of other information, which is pretty cool. And we have this available for the Sandusky River, the Maumee River, and the Cuyahoga River, with I think a couple more rivers being added this year. So it's really helpful in planning our high flow sampling um, and really helpful, for I think, for adult removal crews too to know when to get out there uh, and look for adults during spawning conditions. Another issue that might be at play with our non detections here in these other rivers is kind of detection probability related. Um, so the Sandusky is a pretty narrow river. It's pretty shallow too. So, you know, there's only a certain amount of space those eggs can be floating down and only a certain amount of space we can sample. Um, the Tittabawassee is pretty similar channel morphology wise. However, the Maumee, you know, it's at least three times wider than the Sandusky. It's deeper than the Sandusky. So just if, thinking about it intuitively, the odds of kind of capturing an egg in the Maumee is probably going to be lower than the odds of capturing an egg in the Sandusky River. Um, so again, if we look at the Cuyahoga, it's a very narrow river. It's very deep, so it's channelized. There's a lot of shipping activity in that river. Um, so the flows rise fast, they drop fast. Is that conducive to grass carp spawning? We don't know, um, but we're going to continue monitoring that river for eggs and larvae. All right, so wrapping up our second objective here, we have no new detections in these high-risk tributaries, but we will continue to monitor them um, in the future. All right, so getting into our third objective, which is interpreting those non-detections that I kind of talked about earlier. There's three parts to this. Uh, we want to collect baseline data, um, estimate detection probability, and then there's also this kind of mini study we performed last year in the Sandusky River uh, between electrofishing and egg captures. So I'll talk about that when we get there. So our baseline data collection is pretty straightforward. Um, high flow events are still our top priority. We're really using this baseline data to kind of fill in our gaps in our database. You know, so if we only have data for high flow events, that kind of skews results a little bit, doesn't provide us with a full picture of what's going on. Um, so filling in these gaps kind of in lower flow conditions, different water temperature conditions, will kind of help us determine these thresholds that grass carp, you know, require to spawn. Um, so we sample each river once per month on our list, all seven of those rivers, um, regardless of flow conditions. So low flows, high flows, it doesn't matter. We'll go out there to at least 
all the rivers at least once per month. And we do this with our uh, partners at USGS as well. So they've been great partners helping us sample all this, this huge area with all, all the ground we got to cover. So getting into detection probability, so kind of the meaning of these zeros, uh, we define detection probability as probability of finding an egg given that one's present. Um, so there's two outcomes of this, two binary outcomes. So we have a one where the presence of eggs is observed. That makes sense. That's pretty straightforward. Uh, however, zeros have two interpretations. So spawning could be occurring, but spawning went undetected, or there's no spawning, which we cannot definitively say. So it leads to a lot of uncertainty with these zeros. Um, so it's kind of to combat that uncertainty, uh, we're trying to estimate detection probability using an adaptation of an occupancy model. And so occupancy in this case is the probability of spawning um, where we collect replicates in the same time and space. So we, we collect replicates at the same day or same sampling day at the same site or location on the river. So that's what the time and space is referring to. And the goal here is really to estimate how often we miss eggs that are known to be present in the system. Um, so if we capture an egg in our deep net, uh, but not our surface net, we know spawning was occurring, but we didn't detect it in all of our samples. So that's kind of where we're going with this and how we want to determine detection probability. And so the way this data is set up is from this figure on the right, where we have sampling events. So each row is a sampling event. Um, each column is a replicate. So in this case, we have four sampling events with four replicates. Each replicate is a sign that one or a zero, you know, whether eggs were collected or whether eggs were not collected. And so we have replicate samples collected on five dates so far from 2022. Uh, however, we're looking for more and for more data for this. So we're going to continue doing this in the future um, in 2023. And really, this is taking place on two sites in the Sandusky River, site one and site two. Um, so they're pictured here in the red dots. This triangle is downtown Fremont, Ohio. Um, that kind of shaded region next to downtown Fremont is the known grass carp spawning grounds, um, which is just kind of on the upstream side of Brady's Island there, which is denoted there. Also, if you can kind of see, there's a black horizontal line right here, which is a proposed seasonal uh, barrier that is hopefully gonna be constructed in the near future. Right now, Ohio DNR and the Army Corps of Engineers are working on a feasibility study for this but it's likely going to be a mixture of uh, bubble screen and sound or some version of that um, to kind of turn on and off during the grass carp spawning season and then turn off once the spawning season is over. So that's super cool, but that is in the near future. Um, and so kind of transferring or switching gears here, you know, I start talking about the electrofishing and egg capture study that I mentioned briefly. Um, so again, we kind of did this at site one and site two, but our hypothesis was that electrofishing in this part of the Sandusky River, so in or near the grass carp spawning grounds, is negatively influencing kind of our grass carp egg presence in our samples at site one and site two, just downstream of the grass carp spawning grounds. And so to do this, we did kind of a targeted sampling effort in 2022, um, where we collected eggs before and during electrofishing. So beforehand, we kind of coordinated with electrofishing crews. You know, they usually start at you know, 7 a.m. We kind of coordinated so they wouldn't start until a little bit after 9, um, so we could get our sampling in beforehand. So we sampled site 1 and site 2 between 6 and 9 a.m. Um, and tried to get as many samples as we possibly could. You know, we can't get too many. You know, it's, there's a lot of post-sampling work that goes into this. So there's a lot of lab work, so we have to kind of be smart about it as well. And so once we finished our sampling around 9 a.m., uh, the electrofishing crews got on the water and went up to the spawning grounds. And after they uh, were finished with their first run in the spawning grounds, we started back up our sampling and sampled for another three or so hours, collecting as many samples as we could. And so that was a during portion of this. Um, so what this kind of revealed was pretty interesting. So we had two confirmed spawning events in 2022, uh, where we collected 104 samples between the two of those. But uh, as you can see here, the number of samples of grass carp eggs present before electrofishing was about 73%, so pretty high. Um, whereas during electrofishing in the spawning grounds, the number of samples of eggs present was only 31%. So it's a pretty stark difference. Um, and it was statistically significant, uh, you know, based on the chi-square test. So that's pretty interesting to note. Um, 
And so we did capture lower, lowered egg presence during electrofishing in the spawning grounds. However, other factors should be quantified as well. Um, but it's really difficult to do because we're at the mercy of these high flow events. We can't choose whether these high flow events happen in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening. You know, if we think time of day has any influence, um, you know, we can't, you know, if we want to look at ascending versus descending hydrograph limbs, we can't, you know, choose to spawn or choose to sample on an ascending limb versus a descending limb, which kind of at the mercy of these high flow events and when they happen and when, when we can actually sample. Um, we can also only delay the strike team so long. A larger goal of the project is to remove adult grass carp. Um, so they're gracious enough to start, you know, a few hours after they normally do on these spawning times. Um, but again, we can only do so much there. Um, and these spawning times are really when they capture a lot of these adult grass carp. So it's really high catch rates for those strike teams. So, uh, you know, we're working with them as much as we can with this. But the kind of the, the positive outcome of this is that electric fishing may disrupt spawning and could inhibit it until a seasonal barrier is constructed. So it's kind of that famous saying, you can have your cake and eat it too. We can remove these adult grass carp from the system and also disrupt them from spawning or inhibit spawning, which would be pretty cool. Um, I think uh, this has kind of been alluded to in kind of other scientific studies as well. I know Patrick Kossi kind of in, alluded to this in one of his um, from sampling on the Sandusky kind of in the same general area or just downstream of the spawning grounds while electrofishing was going on, kind of notice fewer, um, a lower magnitude of egg captures there. So it's, it seems to be a trend that's somewhat consistent so far, but we'll continue that in the future. So wrapping up our third objective, our collection of baseline data is still ongoing. Um, estimating detection probability is also in progress. We plan to continue sampling at site one and site two next year to get more uh, replicates. Electrofishing and egg captures uh, for that little mini study. Um, so lower egg captures are occurring during electrofishing in the spawning grounds, which is pretty cool. Um, but we do want to kind of continue that work in the future as well to see if that is a pattern that holds true. Um, so be looking to do that again in 2023, um, where you know we're again we're at the mercy of these high flow events for for this kind of data collection. You know, in 2020 there was no high flow events, there's no spawning going on, so it's really at the mercy of these flow conditions and water temperatures. So our next steps, as I just mentioned, we'll continue to sample high risk tributaries. Um, so there's other rivers besides the Sandusky and Maumee. Um, continue collecting baseline data as well. We also want to do a 24-hour sampling day in the Sandusky next year to kind of refine that time of day effect. Um, we are able to calculate you know, fertilization times based on water temperatures and egg stage information. Um, but again, if we're only sampling you know, during certain parts of the day, that might kind of skew those results. So getting at a larger range of hours uh, for sampling is kind of needed to, to look at that, which also may help refine our hydrograph location too, so ascending versus descending limbs. Um, so I mentioned flu egg briefly before as well. So flu egg predict, helps predict um, hatch locations of these eggs. So we want to kind of focus our larvae effort there in the future. So we haven't got caught very many larvae at all in the project. So we really want to kind of try and focus on these predicted hatch locations to see if we're able to come up with any larvae in the Sandusky or Maumee um, uh, for next year. And we also want to experiment with different sampling gears as well. Um, our bongo nets are pretty active sampling gears. The stratified conical net, which we've listed here, is a more passive sampling gear, which could be a little bit more beneficial maybe to crews. And something that, <clears throat> you know, adult strike teams maybe can set out and leave and we can pick up, you know, something along those lines that might help with getting a little bit more data uh, in-house. So this is just a um, kind of the structure of the whole entire grass car project. I just mentioned or talked about the early life history research today. Um, there's a lot of other research groups and kind of removal and early detection groups. So it's a massive, large, multi-agency collaborative research and removal effort for grass carp in Lake Erie um, and really Great Lakes in general. So it's pretty cool to be a part of, a lot of people working together and a lot of uh, information being shared between one another. And with that, I can take any questions. Thank you so much for that great presentation, Ryan. We do have um, a few questions that have come through. The first one is, can isolated sampling sites be monitored by community volunteers who are living in the area? So that's a good question. I think it's a little hard to do. So as I mentioned, these grass carp spawn during high flows. 
<clears throat> something like the Sandusky, let's say, it's kind of dangerous to be out there on the river during these high flow conditions. And we generally catch a lot of our eggs in our deep paired bongo net. So it's really a lot of force coming down the river, a lot of force going against our nets, going against our boat. Um, so it's probably a little bit dangerous for folks um, to do it themselves, you know. So it'd be cool if it could happen, but it's probably not too feasible. Great. Um, the next question is for your analysis of spawning on the rising versus falling limb of the hydrograph. Did you use the egg capture times or egg fertilization times? So capture time minus developmental time estimated from egg stage and water temperature. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, we just used the capture times. We just kind of looked at that briefly, but I think it would be probably useful to look at those fertilization times as well um, to kind of figure out, you know, when they spawn from, because that would, you know, make a little bit more sense. So that's something we'll probably do in the future, in the near future. Um, okay, the next question is, how do you define the river as high risk? Yeah, so it changes river to river. So 5,000 CFS or cubic feet per second on the Sandusky is high flow conditions on the Sandusky, but that on the Maumee is pretty low flow conditions. So it's, it changes river to river. Um, and generally, we kind of have our thresholds for when we think spawning occurs. So over 1,000 cubic, cubic feet per second on the Sandusky we consider spawning or high flow conditions. Um, anything over, I think, 10 or 15,000 on the Maumee, we consider high flow responding conditions. Um, so that's what we've identified there. We're really not sure in these other rivers, um, but we do know being out like on the Cuyahoga per se at 2000 is pretty risky up in the upper section of that because it is quite narrow. Um, and there's kind of a lot of obstacles and a lot of debris floating down the river. So it's, it varies river to river. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, why do you think that you found so few larval grass carp? That is the million dollar question. So I think there's kind of theories that there's Goldilocks spawning on the Sandusky River. So they need really specific flow conditions and really specific water temperatures for eggs to hatch. We don't know that, but that's kind of the theory being, theory being floated around. Um, you know, the Maumee is a lot longer stretch of a river than the Sandusky is, so it makes sense that we've caught actual larvae there. But again, the lack of larvae since 2018, it's tough to say. I, it could be detection probability related. Um, there's a lot of factors that can go into it that we're probably not really sure about. Awesome, thank you. Uh, the next question is, have you considered using egg mats to capture eggs that may settle on the bottom um, that may be missed by your bongo nets? Yeah, so I actually just had that thought a couple of days ago. Uh, haven't talked about it too much with our partners, but I think that's something might be worth looking into. Um, you know, if we do find a lot of grass carp eggs that are sinking and, you know, falling on those egg mats, that might mean these flow conditions are not right for egg survival and that, you know, recruitment might be kind of low, risk of recruitment might be kind of low. It's, it's potential, but I think it might be worth looking into that it hasn't really been talked about a lot. Great, um, thank you. The next question is, are triploid grass carps still being stocked today? Uh, yes, they are. It varies state by state. Some states ban the complete possession of any type of grass carp. Um, some states allow triploid grass carp stocking. Uh, I think some states even allow diploid and triploid grass carp stocking. Um, around Lake Erie, uh, I know Michigan has a ban. Um, triploids are allowed to be stocked in Ohio. Um, I think there's a couple other states around Lake Erie that have bans on it as well. Um, so really very state by state. Awesome. Thank you. Um, it looks like that's all the questions we have for today. So if uh, you do have one and, and we couldn't get to it, please feel free to just send an email to your registration email um, or Ryan has provided his email down below so you can also contact him. Um, but yeah, thank you again to, for, to Ryan for presenting today and thank you to everyone for tuning in. This webinar was recorded and it'll be posted on our websites, asiancarp.ca, as well as the invasive species center.ca websites. And just a quick reminder to please fill out the survey um, when the webinar closes. We'd really appreciate your feedback. And yeah, stay tuned for future webinars. So thanks again, Ryan. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Have a great day, everyone.